To do. Vassal to his highness, Prince Dimitri. It would be best if you kept your distance from me. The people of Dusker are despised in Fodlan. Nothing remains of Dusker. Despite Three Houses' multicultural cast, Fodlan is a fundamentally isolationist society. The policies embraced by the Church of Seros facilitate internal stability by plunging the continent into perpetual war with its neighboring regions, encouraging its people to develop the sort of xenophobic mindset that naturally leads to prejudice and discrimination. A potent example of this is the tragedy of Dusker, the beginning of Dimitri's fall and Didu's story. In Imperial Year 1176, a number of royals and nobles from Fargus were assassinated during a diplomatic mission to Dusker, including the king and queen consort. The already existing prejudice against the people of Dusker led to their wrongful blame, and in retaliation, they were subjugated and massacred. Didu was one of the very few survivors of the ordeal, only escaping thanks to the intervention of his saviour and future ruler Dimitri. Dimitri reaching past the bounds of ethnicity to offer Didu his hand compels Didu to take up a position as Dimitri's retainer and voluntary vassal. This births two of Didu's defining, intrinsically linked characteristics the discrimination he faces, and his devotion to Dimitri. Didu lost everything, and got no reprieve, immediately being thrust into a society that hates him for who he is and the false sins of his people. But it's his reaction to that, and how it moulds him that speaks to me. After Claude, Didu comes to my mind first when considering the game's depiction of dealing with discrimination. The two present a surprisingly realistic dichotomy, where Claude feels chafed by it, devoting his power to righting that wrong by any means, Didu's just used to it. It's life for him. When Ash tells him the extent to which his people are quite literally demonised, he responds with mirthless laughter. That acclimatization reflects an attitude you might see in older members of minorities, showing how his circumstances have aged him. All the same, he's understandably weary of the mistreatment he receives, even at Garag Mark, which from his Dimitri and Ash supports we know to not be a safe haven. He also admits to finding Fargus abhorrent. It's tempered by his laconic speech though. Just like Claude, his awareness of how he's perceived seeps into his overall demeanour, where Claude is shrewd and a skilled conversationalist, using his charisma to further his ambition, to do his taciturn and stoic. A tough nut to crack in conversation. You know it's rough when the walking mannequin finds you awkward. That said, getting used to this abuse has given Didu incredibly thick skin for his age. Despite his silence, the calluses on his soul speak volumes. The sad irony is, he's actually a grade A gentle giant, unfailingly polite and patient to almost everyone. Whether it's Annette and Flane's culinary antics, or Felix straight up calling him a dog. He even bonds with Shamir, of all people, over their shared quietness and status as outsiders. And his hobbies include cooking and gardening, activities requiring care and diligence based around caring for others. In fact, his aloofness is a fittingly awkward expression of his kindness. Several times, he questions his support partners talking to him, outright warning Sylvain and Byleth the way, out of fear of implicating them with his presence as a person of Dusker. Clearly, he sees himself as something of a social liability. That's why he's often surprised by his classmates trying to bond with him. Ash, Sylvain, and especially Mercedes stand out. Ash becomes a true friend to him, pushing through his initial intimidation to get to know Didu, and they bond over their shared love of cooking and loss in their lives. In Sylvain, Didu finds a sort of silent ally that actively questions the truth behind the tragedy, calling out the dubious circumstances surrounding it that others won't. Didu repays the favour by trying to dispel the, not entirely undeserved, rumours surrounding Sylvain's behaviour with women. He may not say it, but it means a lot to Didu to be seen not just as a person of Dusker, but merely a person. Those that do earn a relentlessly supportive friend. A real ride or die. On that note, I'm giving Mercedes a special nod because, frankly, I ship these two pretty hard, and even I don't know why. A woman of the cloth 
Mercedes shocks Didi with her curiosity about Duska's religion. Enraptured by their conversations about Duska's culture and history, not to mention Didi's cooking, she chooses to visit herself in their A support, something only she does. Didi's been abused his whole life because of where he's from, spat on and stoned forced to hide any pride in his country, only to meet a woman so interested in it, in him, she actively suggests visiting. If you listen real close, you can hear him falling for her. Mercedes is the complete antithesis to what Didius used to, and she bewilders him, even among his friends. They admit to finding his bearing and ethnicity intimidating, but as Mercedes says, she's different. She makes a point of saying she's never had anything against him and shows him nothing but joyful curiosity. When Didu questions her curiosity about Duska, she glides past the wall he erects with ease, reminding Didu of his value. Duska may be gone, but you're still here. It's a powerful way of telling Didu that he carries the pride of his country and that his memories keep it alive, which is paid forward in their ending where they sow the seeds that ultimately lead to Duska's revival. Honestly, despite the difficulties he faces at Garak Mark, it might actually be the place for Didu to be. At the very least, he's near Dimitri, is away from the prejudiced masses in Ferdiad, and he's surrounded by wholly tolerant peers. Mostly. Didu and Ingrid's sea support is the starkest on-screen example of discrimination Didu encounters from another student, at least until Heroes 3 Felix under the bus. That said, we should recall the specifics. Didu checks on Ingrid after helping her during the battle, and Ingrid responds tersely, saying she doesn't need his help and calling his apology for bothering her empty. Honestly, if not for her mentioning the people of Dusker after, you'd think she was just rude, not that it was a nationality thing. While ultimately a microaggression, this exchange says much about both Didi and Ingrid. Ingrid's immediate apology tells us she knows she's out of line, but her microaggression slipping out at all gives her away. Ingrid's Dimitri support tells us the tragedy stole her fiancé. This reveals Ingrid's discrimination as really an irrational expression of grief. Indeed, irrationality and emotional confusion pervade Ingrid's initial behaviour. Ingrid asking to do for the truth of the tragedy in the B support especially strikes me as strange. The mere suggestion to do might know the truth of the tragedy himself and just quietly take his abuse is pretty bizarre, and her putting the onus on him to speak up against the prejudice of her people, including her, right after admitting she rejoiced hearing his people were slaughtered, as if stepping out of line wouldn't be a massive risk, shows a comical lack of tact. And dare I say, smacks of privilege. She's not thinking it through clearly, making apparent the conflict between her anger at who she blames for the tragedy versus her regret at mistreating someone innocent, especially as a wannabe knight. Not helping is that he contrasts her mental image of his people. This is conjecture, but I'm not even sure she truly believes the tragedy was caused by the people of Duska any more than that she's latching onto that explanation for some kind of closure. Dimitri himself vouches for Duska, and Sylvain calls out the dubious nature of the tragedy, even theorising that there must be other doubters, and I agree. However, until there's definitive proof, the heartbroken masses of Fargus will vent their anguish on the people of Duska. Ingrid's treatment of Didu here is the tip of the iceberg, a microcosm of the kind of prejudice Didu and his people unjustly suffer after the tragedy and the layers underpinning it, which will take time and effort to remove. There's much more to be said about this support and the depiction of Ingrid's discrimination, good and bad, but to keep this video focused on Didu himself, I'll leave it there. So, besides demonstrating his ungodly patience for Ingrid's nonsense, what does this support say about our man? Didu's response to catching Ingrid in 4K is minimal to say the least. Him saying, save your breath, sounds somewhat passive aggressive, but I honestly think he just didn't consider an explanation necessary. As I said, this is life for him, why bother questioning it? Moreover, he seems genuinely confused by Ingrid's conflict. I want to say the support shows how strong Didu is, staying cool in the face of bigotry, but this confusion makes me wonder, is it strength or is he just institutionalised? I'm inclined to the latter. Even if it were strength, it would be an unfair strength that society forced on him, the price to pay for his thick skin. But what's most striking here 
is what he is concerned about. He says he's looking out for Ingrid for Dimitri's sake. Even now, he's more concerned with Dimitri's feelings than his own. This laser focus on Dimitri is consistent throughout his supports. His Shamir support contrasts his die-hard devotion to Dimitri with her more casual relationship with Rhea, and he folds Gilbert in their support because he looked up to him. But by abandoning Dimitri, Gilbert let him down. Because letting people down is so new for Gilbert, it's telling that Ingrid's discrimination is water of a duck's back, but Gilbert abandoning Dimitri draws his ire. The same goes with his Felix support, where he's chill until Felix trash talks young Spaghetti Head. Didu's allegiance to Dimitri is honestly unsettling at points, and thus we arrive at Didu's raison d'être. Didu and Dimitri's relationship is equally sentimental and toxic. Just as his stony face was chiseled by pain, Didu's gratitude for Dimitri overflows into his behaviour, purposely submitting himself to Dimitri, making even Dimitri uncomfortable. It's the same pattern as Cyril's idolising Rhea, and Didu's compassionate fear about implicating others with his presence makes him actively deny Dimitri's attempts at an equal friendship. It does make sense. In a world of darkness, Dimitri is his shining light, saving his life protecting him from persecution, and even teaching him to read and write. Even so, one of the last members of an unjustly massacred people willfully dehumanizing himself for the prince of the country responsible is almost a betrayal. It's sad that Didu continues this even when Dimitri becomes a genuine liability, which Felix raises in his own brusque way. When he questions the limits of Didu's obedience to Dimitri, Didu admits that he would do unspeakable things if Dimitri wished it. It's horrifying to think this is the extent of his gratitude. That said, it's not like he's turned his back on his people entirely, nor stopped thinking for himself completely. His paralogue directly confronts him with the unjust suffering they still endure. His decision to fight them is a rough one, especially considering how it makes him look. Fighting on the same side as the bigots that call his people filthy beasts and doubling down on their prior suffering. But he does so to force them to withdraw before the Kingdom Army can slaughter them. He's protecting them, even though it hurts. This paralogue tells us two things about him. One, Didu still holds his patriotic compassion for his countrymen. He hasn't lost his dusker spirit. And two, Didu's attachment to Dimitri isn't just gratitude, but also a genuine belief. Specifically, belief that Dimitri will turn Fargus from a country he abhors to a place his people can call home. Didu's wholehearted belief in Dimitri speaks for itself, but also recontextualizes Didu's behavior. It's not just a matter of repaying Dimitri's kindness. In his own way, Didu's trying to secure the future of his people, which bears fruit in their paired ending, where Dimitri does the impossible in reconciling Fargus and Dusker. I saw someone called Didu pure, which I initially laughed at. Man literally said he'd kill children if Dimitri asked him to. But pure really is the best word to describe him. Whether it's his generosity, self-sacrificial nature, or devotion to Dimitri, his words are honest, his motives are clear, and his actions are absolute, right or wrong. In a game filled with liars, schemers, and unreliable narrators, that intense authenticity is a standout. But as Shamir warns him, it's also a weakness. True to her words, Didu's devotion to Dimitri poses a bigger threat to him than any enemy soldier ever could. In Crimson Flower, he can be cut down by Edelgard's army, or willingly become a demonic beast to protect Dimitri, a visual representation of him dehumanizing himself for Dimitri. Meanwhile, Dimitri's death in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind shoves Didu onto the same dark path Dimitri tread. Just as Dimitri was driven by the ghosts of his dead loved ones, Didu becomes a walking corpse, fueled only by the spectre of Dimitri's vengeful will. That dangerously pure devotion and compassion is a shared trait between them. And I want to emphasize that reciprocity. In a way, Dimitri is as indebted and devoted to Didu as Didu is to him, which Dimitri openly expresses in the race support. Your Highness, you still have scars on your back. It does you no good to languish in pain. I will procure some medicine. No, it is fine. Though they are still deep, these are from nine years ago. They do not hurt any longer. And besides, it would be a shame if the scars I got from protecting you were to fade. I bear these scars proudly. 
It makes me think that it was worthwhile that someone like me survived. To hear you say such things. To do, you say that I saved you. But do you know that you also saved me that day? If I had been unable to save anyone, I would have been the sole survivor. I would have had no reason to keep living. But I saved someone. Saved you. That and that alone has always been my crutch. Just as Dimitri saved Didi physically, Didi saved Dimitri emotionally, giving him a reason not to join his lost loved ones. This is a major reason for Dimitri devoting himself to clearing the names of the people of Duska and protecting Dudu from the prejudice he faces in the present day. Whether Dudu accepts it or not, he's the brother Dimitri never had, and gives his life meaning. That's why losing him in Azure Moon further compounds Dimitri's psychosis. They're each other's staunchest supporters, and when one loses the other, they fall to their own dark impulses. But together, they can support each other through anything. This is exemplified by Dimitri's defeat in Crimson Flower, if Dudu is still human. Your Majesty. Your Majesty! <laughs> Stop calling me that. Oh, thank the... No! Dudu, it seems I will die before I can get revenge for everyone. <laughs> My family... My friends, my home, everything that truly mattered to me, I couldn't. You're wrong. Because of you, I was able to live on until today. You saved me. These past nine years, I am proud to have been at your side. It was a joy I never could have hoped for. Despite all, I count myself a lucky man. Is that so? <laughs> I see. I am glad. You must be weary, Your Majesty. Please, rest in peace. With everything they fought and bled for lost, Didu performs one last service for his ruler and brother, being a light for Dimitri in his last moments, just as Dimitri was for him, sending him off peacefully. This was Crimson Flower's most poignant moment for me. In this moment, my heart really was with these two. Granted, I wasn't exactly rocking with AD anyway, but the point stands. And it's because of this that I feel the need to discuss how Azure Moon handles to do. As in Silver Snow and Verdant Wind, Didu risks his neck busting Dimitri out of prison, when Dimitri's framed for his uncle's murder and is presumed to die helping Dimitri escape. Should he complete Didu's paralogue in part 1, the soldiers of Duska he saved help him survive, and he returns during part 2, facilitating Dimitri's return from the brink. But if Didu's defeated during part 1, or you don't do his paralogue, that's it. He's dead. Frankly, this condition was a complete mistake. I praised a similar gameplay story mechanic with Marianne, but unlike Marianne, Didu has a strong, personal, and narrative connection to a very plot-relevant character in Dimitri. The main issue is, regardless of whether or not Didu returns, Dimitri's arc and Dajor Moon's plot progress exactly the same. This hugely undermines Didu's importance to Dimitri, in turn weakening their dynamic by making it seem one-sided and weakening Dimitri's goal to help Duska. I'm sure it's unintentional, but the damage is still done. It's even stranger when you compare it to how crucially Byleth, someone Dimitri really doesn't know that well, is portrayed to his recovery. I guess you could say our dude, Dudu, got to done dirty. That was truly cringeworthy. Despite all that, the value in Dudu and Dimitri's relationship remains clear. Their familial, self-sacrificial bond serves as a foil to Hubert and Edelgard's clandestine conspiracy and Hilda's casual whatever it is with Claude. Let's be blunt though, this is straight up codependency. Did you initially consider himself nothing but Dimitri's sword and shield, and very likely goes out the same way. Meanwhile, Dimitri turns himself into Dudu's unsolicited avenger in Azure Moon. As much strength as their bond gives them, it simultaneously feeds their greatest flaws. It's an uplifting, uncomfortable brotherhood. Despite his limited story presence, character interactions, and even dialogue, 
Did you says quite a lot to me, not all of it pleasant. It's easy to relate his struggles to those of real life minorities. His quote unquote scary face and his people being seen as savages recall old school perceptions of dark skinned people that sadly still present as bias today. Meanwhile, the microaggressions he faces, outsider status, verbal and literal dehumanization he goes through are issues still faced by minorities universally. Honestly, if we look at Didu as a proxy for real life minorities, his depiction arises several uncomfortable implications and overtones, some of which I've alluded to. Ultimately, Didu's an example of how circumstance can manipulate a gentle soul, just like Dimitri. From his quiet displays of kindness, under cruel and unfair prejudice, to the manic fatal devotion that same prejudice pushes him to. The dude's a victim of the world he lives in, but with his brother beside him, one day he might overcome that. I hope so. It's certainly what he deserves.